Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India today is going to be on Motzkin decomposable sets of functions. The notion of a uh, Motzkin decomposable set uh, was very recently introduced. Although the name is after Motzkin, uh, well-known mathematician from the first half of the 20th century. Um, the notion of Motzkin decomposable set uh, is inspired by a result which is very well known in linear programming theory which says that every convex polyhedron can be expressed as the sum of a polytope and a polyhedral uh, convex cone, namely the polytope generated by the extreme points of the set and the uh, convex cone generated by the extreme rays of the set. Uh, so these convex polyhedra are expressable as sums of a compact convex set, the polytope, plus a closed convex cone. Yeah. And uh, the, the question that arises in a natural way is uh, which uh, are those sets which uh, enjoy this uh, decomposability property. We know that convex polyhedra satisfy these properties, but uh, there is a larger class of sets. And they enjoy um, many nice properties which uh, convex polyhedra enjoy. Uh, the talk is going to be based on three papers. These are the only three papers, as far as I know, in which the notion of uh, Motzkin decomposition is uh, used. The three papers are uh, co-authored by uh, Miguel Angel Goberna from the University of Alicante, Spain, and Maxim Todorov from uh, University de las Americas, Puebla, Mexico. There is also another co-author in the first paper, uh, Enrique González, who at the time of making this paper was a PhD student of Maxim Todorov. And in the last paper, there is another co-author, Alfredo Yusem, from IMPA uh, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The three papers are in the Journal of Mathematical Analysis and Applications. The first two of them were published in 2010. And the last paper is already online, but not, uh, has not appeared in print yet. Well, so let us start with the definition of um, a Motzkin decomposable set. Uh, we are uh, working with subsets of the Euclidean space, Rn. We consider an unempty set F, and we call it uh, Motzkin decomposable if there exists a compact convex set C and a closed convex cone D such that C plus D is equal to F. Given that we are adding two convex sets, the sum F will be convex. And since we are adding a compact set with a closed set, the sum F will be closed. Therefore, Motzkin decomposable uh, sets are closed convex sets. But the converse does not hold true. As it's very easy to see, and we are actually going to see it later, there are many uh, closed convex sets which cannot be uh, expressed as a sum of this type. When we do have such a decomposition, we call the pair CD a Motzkin decomposition of the set. And the set C will be a compact component and the set D will be the conic component. I say the conic component because it is uniquely determined by the set, unlike a compact component. There may be many compact components, actually infinitely many compact components for a given set, but there is only one possible conic component, which is the recession cone of F, namely the set of all directions along which um, uh, if you follow one starting from an arbitrary point of the set, you never leave the set. Uh, this is a large class of uh, closed convex sets, 
as I said at the beginning, it includes all convex polyhedra, but it also includes all compact convex sets because we can take d equal to the singleton of zero. It also includes all closed convex cone because we can take c equal to the singleton of zero. Uh, then it's a large class, but uh, it doesn't exhaust the whole class of closed convex um, sets. We can now define an extended real valued function to be Motskin decomposable when it has a Motskin decomposable epigraph. Um, for some characterizations, this set plays an important role. This is the closed convex hull of the extreme points of the intersection of the set with the orthogonal subspace to the linearity space of F. The linearity space of F is the set of all directions corresponding to lines which are fully contained in the set. Or in other words, is the intersection of the recession cone with the opposite. Uh, and uh, we need to consider this intersection because we want to talk about extreme points. And it is well known that a closed convex set has at least one extreme point, if and only if it has no lines. That is to say, if and only if the linearity space of F reduces to zero. So in this particular case, when there are no lines, this linearity space reduces to zero. The orthogonal is the whole space, so the intersection here is superfluous. The intersection gives f. So in that case, q of f will simply be the closed convex hull of the set of the extreme points of f. But even if there are no extreme points, we are considering extreme points of a smaller set thanks to this trick. We can call this, inter this intersection the uh, lines-free version of f. We have fear here first uh, a characterization of Motskin decomposability for a non-empty closed convex set. A set F being non-empty, closed and convex is Motskin decomposable if only if the set of extreme points of the lines free version of F is bounded. And in this case the set Q of F which we have seen before, namely the uh, closed convex hull of this set of extreme points is a compact component of F. But as I said before, there may be many compact components. But in the case when the set has no lines, this compact component is the smallest possible. Conning component is unique. More than one compact component, but yes. the cone component is unique. Yeah, it's unique. But compact component, there be many. Okay. But in the case there are no extreme points, mm. among the many, mm. this is the smallest possible. If there are lines, there is no smallest possible. Even there is no minimal one with respect to inclusion. Okay? Uh, uh, well, as a corollary of this theorem, we have that every phase of a Motskin decomposable set, it's Motskin decomposable too. This uh, comes from two facts. First, that the linearity space of a phase is the same as the linearity space of the whole set. And second, that one can easily check the lines-free version of a phase is a phase of the lines-free version of the set. And then the extreme points of the lines-free version of the phase mm. will be extreme points of the lines-free version of the set. If the set is bounded, then this uh, subset will be bounded too. Hence, we have the corollary as an immediate conclusion. Another immediate conclusion is this last corollary here, that if we have a Motskin decomposable function which is bounded from below, then the set of its global minima is Motskin decomposable. And notice that Motskin decomposable implies non-emptiness. Every Motskin decomposable set is uh, non-empty. So here, in particular, we are saying that uh, whenever a Motskin decomposable function is bounded from below, it attains the infimum. It attains a minimum. This property is well known for polyhedral uh, convex functions. 
it's something like a frank wolf theorem for quadratic program yeah, yeah. Hmm. but uh, i mean this is a direct uh, generalization of um, what is known in linear programming uh, i forgot to say that a polyhedral convex function is much decomposable because a polyhedral convex function which is the maximum of a uh, finite collection of affine functions has an epigraph which is a convex polyhedron mm -hmm. and therefore it's much decomposable so this class of functions, mm -hmm. much decomposable, contain in particular the polyhedral convex functions. They also contain sublinear functions mm, yes. because sublinear functions uh, are um, have um, an epigraph which is a closed convex cone. Yeah. Uh, so again, this result follows from the main theorem because one can easily identify the set of global minima with a phase of the polyhedron of the excuse me of the um, epigraph of the function there are some questions we can make to understand the structure of um, much decomposable functions for instance consider the restriction of one sum function to a hyperplane is it necessarily much decomposable well first of all we need to make the question more precise since we are dealing all the time with functions defined on the whole of Rn, when we make the restriction with a hyperplane, we are no longer uh, working with a function uh, having full domain. So we have to extend the restriction to the complement of the um, hyperplane and we do it by the value plus infinity. Okay, so the restriction is actually the function which is obtained from the original function by replacing the values the function takes outside H by plus infinity. So, is such a restriction much decomposable? Can you stop for a second? I'll go to the bathroom. The lights are too much. It's, I can't take the eyes. I'm feeling very... Uh, too much of light. Can the light be dimmed a bit? Mm -hmm. I'm feeling too much uh, disturbed with light. We were addressing the question whether the restriction of a much decomposable function to a hyperplane is necessarily much decomposable and the answer is no. Here we have an easy example in two dimensions, a function of two variables, the Euclidean norm. Uh, the Euclidean norm is much decomposable because its epigraph is the classical ice cream cone. As long as it is a closed convex cone, it's much decomposable. Nevertheless, if you take as uh, the hyperplane, a vertical hyperplane, not containing the, the origin, not containing the vertex of the cone, then uh, what would be the restriction of uh, this function to this uh, hyperplane? The epigraph of this restriction would be um, the area enclosed by uh, a branch of a hyperbola, which is not much can decomposable because the set of extreme points is the whole boundary, which is unbounded. Therefore, it cannot be, according to the theorem we saw below, um, cannot be uh, much can decomposable. But if the hyperplane is a supporting hyperplane to the domain of the function, then the restriction is much can decomposable. The reason is that in that case, the epigraph of the restriction would be a phase of the epigraph of the whole function and then it would be much decomposable. There are several questions we can uh, address related to operations with uh, much decomposable sets. Here is one. Suppose we have two closed convex sets A and B and one of them say B is much decomposable and when we make the sum the sum is much decomposable too. Can we deduce from this fact that the other set, A, is much decomposable too? The answer is no, as I will show by an easy example uh, soon. But the answer is yes if we uh, impose the additional assumption that the recession cone of the set B is contained in the linearity space of A. To see that without this assumption, the property does not hold, look at this example here. The set A is 
uh, let's say a vertical parabola, okay? The area enclosed by a vertical parabola. Okay, we can make a picture if it makes This would be A. Then the set B is the horizontal axis. Mm. And what is A plus B? Yep. A plus B would be the full upper thing uh, except this line. No, no, including this line. Oh, achha, you, achha, set is X2. Huh? You are the whole thing, the whole, 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 whole half space. Is the whole uh, uh, upper half space. Upper half plane. Then you have B is much in the composable mm. because it's a closed convex cone, it's a subspace. The same with A plus B, it's a half plane, so it's also much in the composable. Nevertheless, our original set A, the parabola, is not much in the composable for the same reason as we saw before in an example. The set of extreme points is unbounded, it's the whole boundary. Of course, in but this case, here the case uh, B uh, is not bounded. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. The, the condition, uh, the result, as you can see here, is that we are assuming that both B and A plus B are much in the composable. Um, B and A plus B are. B much is the horizontal axis. Hmm. A plus B is the upper half plane. So that the recession cone. But we is don't in have the this inclusion, of course. This is not contained in the linearity space of A mm. because the recession cone of B is the full oh, of B. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the linearity space of A is reduces to zero. A contains no lines, mm. so the inclusion does not hold. This shows that this extra assumption in the proposition is not superfluous. But in particular, if the set B is bounded, is compact, mm -hmm. then the recession cone reduces to zero and it will be contained in the linearity space of A. So in such a case, the property holds. This is what is said in this corollary mm. at the bottom of the page, in which uh, on top of these um, assumptions, uh, there is some refinement. We are not assuming that A and B are closed. A and B are just convex. And B is bounded, but we don't say closed or compact. Then, uh, in spite of these um, weaker assumptions, we get the same conclusion. If A plus B is most decomposable, then A must be most decomposable. This is based on this lemma, which is a very easy statement in, uh, in convexity, but which, uh, the proof of which is not completely obvious. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's an exercise. It's not terribly difficult, but it's not a standard proof in convexity. It says if we have two non-empty sets such that A is convex, just mm -hmm. convex, mm -hmm. B is compact, just mm -hmm. compact, mm -hmm. and A plus B is closed, then A must be closed. Just one observation. This result doesn't hold true without convexity of A. For instance, consider any set which is dense but different from the whole set, Rm, then add the unit ball or a ball of arbitrarily small radius, closed ball, which is compact, then A plus B is the whole space, then it is closed. Nevertheless, A was not closed, was a dense subset. Also, with convexity, this result only holds true in finite dimensions. In an infinite dimensional space, it doesn't hold true. Consider, for instance, a reflexive Banach space with the weak topology. Then you can repeat the argument I have used now by choosing a dense hyperplane, which is convex. Then you add a, a closed ball, which is compact under the weak topology. Then you get the whole space. And you repeat the argument I have used before. But even recently, uh, one week ago, Professor Nicolas Hachisabas uh, gave me a very nice example showing that even in an arbitrary Banach space, not necessarily reflexive, and using the norm topology, not the weak topology, uh, this result does not hold. I mean, we can take this result as 
a characterization of finite dimensionality. This result holds true if and only if the uh, space is finite dimensional. Well, um, I'm going to present several uh, characterizations. We have seen already some of uh, Motskin decomposability. Uh, one of them will be based on the notion of the conic representation of an empty closed convex set. The conic representation, k of f, is, roughly speaking, the set of all linear inequalities which are satisfied by all the elements in f. Okay, so for we consider all coefficient vectors a, b in Rn plus 1 corresponding to inequalities which are satisfied by all vectors in f, all points in f, and then the set of all these uh, coefficients make the conic representation of uh, f. Uh, clearly, this is a closed convex cone. Semi-definite programming, uh, semi-infinite programming. This is a notion which uh, I don't know if it was introduced, but at least is extensively, extensively used in uh, linear semi-infinite mm -hmm. programming. Yeah. Oh. The, yeah, yeah. This is very much used in, in that field. Um, then, for instance, it is well known, in fact, this is a version of Farkas' lemma, that if uh, our closed convex set is the solution set of a given uh, linear inequality system mm -hmm. with possibly infinitely many inequalities, we are not saying anything here about the cardinality of t, then the conic representation is the closed convex cone generated by all the inequalities, let's say, together with this particular vector, all components are zero except the last one, which is minus one, the closed convex hull of all these vectors. The reason for which this particular vector appears is that uh, there is always a, um, an inequ a trivial inequality, which is a consequence of a given system of inequalities. Uh, notice, another way of looking at this k of f, in this case, is the set of all consequences, linear consequences, of this linear system. Okay? And there is also a consequence which is uh, which trivially holds, namely, you have the inequality zero a prime transpose x. Uh, we are saying greater than or equal to uh, minus one. Okay, this is this clearly holds true for every x, and this is the reason why this vector appears here. Or, in other words, if you have an inequality a prime x greater than or equal to b, you can always decrease the right-hand side and it will be a valid inequality. Um, the conic representation uh, is, in fact, minus the epigraph of the support function of the set. We also have that a point belongs to the set if and only if, when we add a, a last coordinate minus 1, then the resulting point belongs to the dual cone, positive polar, of the conic representation of the set. And moreover, for every vector in this uh, polar set, dual cone, the last coordinate is less than or equal to zero. The barrier uh, cone of f, which means the set of all linear functionals which are bounded above on f, is minus this set. by k of f uh, head, we mean the projection of k of f onto Rn. k of f is in Rn plus 1. We uh, delete the last coordinate when we get the projection onto Rn. This is the meaning of this expression here. And we also have that the recession cone of f is just the dual cone of this projection. Moreover, f contains no lines or in other words, f contains some extreme point if and only if the interior of this projection is non-empty. The affine set, the affine hull of f is the set of points which solve all uh, this system of equalities where the equations are, are taken from the linearity space of the conic representation of f. Also, 
the boundary of f can be expressed in terms of the conic representation in this way. I have to explain here the notation. Here, f star of c denotes the um, arc mean of the linear function c over f. So, this is arc mean over f of c prime x. So, in fact, what this um, property is telling us is that the boundary is a union of exposed faces. Uh, moreover, an optimal point for the linear function determined by C is uh, such that this point belongs to the conic representation of F and vice versa. Moreover, for C in the interior of this projection, this uh, optimal solution set is non-empty and this does not imply that C is in the interior of the projection but C must belong to the projection. Some easy calculus rules for conic representations. The conic representation of the closed convex hull of a union is the intersection of the um, conic representations of the set and for the intersection is the closure of the sum. Moreover, if the two conic representations have this property that the intersection is a linear subspace, the intersection of one with minus the other. Then this formula simplifies, the closure becomes superfluous and uh, the conic representation of the intersection in that particular case reduces to the sum of the conic representations of the set. When uh, the second set G is a closed convex cone, we have this equality which uh, gives us an expression for the conic representation of the sum. And uh, in particular, we have this intersection when f intersection with minus g is non-empty. We have also an expression for the conic representation of the linear image of a closed convex set under the assumption that this linear image is closed. One can characterize closed convex sets which are cones by using the conic representations. They are those closed convex cones for which the conic representation has this structure. It's a Cartesian product where the second, com where the second component is uh, the non-positive real line. And if such thing occurs, then the first uh, set in this Cartesian product must be the dual cone to F. We also have this uh, uh, proposition which uh, summarizes many properties of convex uh, Motzkin decompositions of a set. Suppose we have one such decomposition, then the conic representation of F is the conic representation of C intersection this set where D is the conic component, so the recession cone. Also we have that the affine hull of the set is the affine hull of a compact component plus the linear space generated by the conic component. If we have a linear mapping such that the image of the recession cone is closed, then the images of the compact component and the conic component make a Motzkin decomposition of the image of F and that, that linear mapping. Fourth property is important because it uh, deals with solution sets of um, uh, linear problems, linear problems subject to nonlinear constraints, x belong to f. This property says that whenever a linear function c prime x is bounded below on f, that is to say when the infimum is not minus infinity, then it is attained, it's a minimum. And this happens when c belongs to the dual cone to d, if and only if. Uh, yep. I just want to, so the fourth property which is very interesting from the optimization point of view. So you are minimizing a convex set over a Motzkin decomposable set. A linear function over a Motzkin decomposable set. A linear function over a Motzkin decomposable set and if it is bounded below then the minimum is attained. Yeah. We, we C is element of D naught. So if C is the element of D naught we can guarantee that uh, it is bounded below? Yes. 
for oh. a mostly decomposable set. But, but, but I have one question. The second line says minimum C transpose X, X belonging to C or it should be X belonging to F. Where? VC when you are writing mean, when you are replacing the infield mean. No, 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 it's C, it's equivalent. Thank you for pointing this out because it's an important observation. Uh, in principle, the function is defined over F. I mean, hmm. we are minimizing over F. Yeah. But this says that there is at least one point in C where the minimum is attained. The, the, there is no typo here. No, it, no, 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 I understand. C. Every element in C is also an element in F because you can add C plus 0. Because Every element in C is an element in yeah, C is always a subset of it. So, oh, okay, the interesting part is the minimum would be attained on C, yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah. on the cone. Only on the compact part, the minimum would be attained. No, no, the minimum can be attained uh, everywhere, but among the optimal solutions, there is at least one which belongs to C. Okay, oh, sorry, among the optimal, oh, right, right, right. If C belongs to D. Like in linear programming, yeah. among the optimal solution, there is a vertex. Yeah, that exactly. is to say belonging to the compact component. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Yeah. The fifth property is also interesting. It says that the barrier cone is minus the dual cone to the recession cone. It's interesting why? Because it's telling us in particular that the barrier cone is uh, closed, which is not always the case in general. I mean, yeah, barrier cone is not closed. Yeah, right. yeah but. Right. And uh, actually, sets with uh, a closed barrier cone are uh, have been already studied. They are called hyperbolic convex sets. So, uh, this shows something which is, is actually an immediate consequence of the definitions that every mostly decomposable set is a hyperbolic convex set. The sixth property is that the set contains no lines if and only if the interior to its dual cone is non empty. Seventh property is that the boundary of F is the union of the exposed faces determine that elements belonging to the dual cone to the recession cone except the origin. In, in the two-dimensional case, a Motkin decomposable set has no asymptote. Here we define asymptote as a half line which doesn't intersect the set but its distance to the set is equal to zero. That means you can find points arbitrarily close to each other, one in the set, one in the line, but they don't intersect. So one can prove that uh, this holds in R2, but um, the convex doesn't hold true, even in R2. I mean, the fact that there is no asymptote does not guarantee that the set is much decomposable. Example, take the parabola. There is no asymptote. Mm -hmm. It's a closed convex set. But the extreme points is the whole boundary. So it's unbounded. So it cannot be much in the composable. What about higher dimensions? The, the statement which was true, namely that a much in the composable set has no asymptote. Does it hold true in, in higher dimensions? The answer is no. Look at this example. We are considering a cone. This is a cone. And if you take the intersection with this hyperplane, it has two asymptotes. And of course, the, as, the asymptotes of a subset, as long as they don't intersect the set, are asymptotes of the set. Look look at this example in dimension 3. Actually, we have seen this for a different purpose before when we were talking about the, the restriction to a hyperplane. Again, take. So this cone in the case n equal 3 is the ice cream cone. Okay? Uh, then, take a vertical hyperplane as before, not containing the origin. The intersection is a hyperbola which has asymptotes. And the asymptotes of the hyperbola will be asymptotes of the cone. This is not very, this is very uh, obvious after listening the explanation, but if 
I don't make the explanation and I ask you which uh, that does this set have asymptotes intuitively at least I would answer no because uh, I mean it consists of, of lines whether it will have a asymptotes yeah that to two but yeah, now has. I understand yeah. but it has so in the case n equal three or higher than three it doesn't hold another result is that a set is much can decomposable if and only if there is, is a set C such that whenever we have a linear function bounded from below on C, then, as you observed before, there is an optimal solution mm. of the corresponding mm. uh, minimization problem with this linear function, which belongs to C, to mm. the compact component. If such a set exists, we know that the set is much can decomposable and the closed convex hull of this set is a compact component of F. Another characterization. I said that much can decomposable sets are hyperbolic, means the barrier cone is closed. But the converse doesn't hold true. We need an extra assumption. We need the restriction of the support function of the set to the barrier cone to have a finite sublinear extension to the whole of our I, I, I just like to recall uh, just the barrier cone definition. Barrier cone is the? The set of linear functions which are bounded above on the set. Barrier cone? Barrier ah, cone. Sir, I mean, you are moving a hyperplane in this direction. Uh -huh. You cannot go beyond uh -huh. the corresponding orthogonal vector uh -huh. pointing in this direction is no, it's an no, no, no. of the barrier cone. No, no, no. There is some relation, some polarity relation with some other set. Yes, 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 with the recession cone. Yeah, exactly. The recession, the recession cone. cone is the polar of, of the, the barrier cone. Exactly, exactly. But if you take polar again, you don't get the barrier cone. You get the, you get the closure yeah, of the barrier cone. Yeah, because you don't have cone. closeness. Pardon me? Polar, polar of the recession cone is the barrier cone. No, it's the closure of the barrier cone in general. Huh. The closure of the barrier no, no. cone. The polar of the barrier cone is the recession cone. This is true. Yeah, because barrier cone is not closed, so you cannot exactly. have. Yeah. When it that is closed, you call the set hyperbolic. Yeah. Okay. And our Motkin decomposable sets are hyperbolic. But a hyperbolic convex set need not be Motkin decomposable. One needs an extra condition, which is this one. The support function has a restriction to the barrier cone, which has a finite value everywhere, finite value sublinear extension to the whole of our end. Uh, what is this finite sublinear extension? Is the uh, support function of a compact component. This is uh, very easy to, um, to understand. Uh, I have no time to, to give more explanations, but this is not a difficult result to obtain. Another characterization of Motskin decomposability in terms of um, conic representations. A set if much can decomposable, if and only if there exist two closed convex cones K and L, such that the conic component, excuse me, the the conic representation of the set has this structure. K L and L are closed convex cones, and the first convex cone K doesn't contain this element, this vertical vector upwards, and the interior of the cone contains this vertical uh, vector, top. which is downwards. Another set which uh, is important for the description of Motskin decomposable sets is the set M of F uh, defined here. We call L the orthogonal to the linearity space of F. We call K the intersection of the recession cone with L. This makes K pointed. In general, the recession cone of A contains lines, but when we make this intersection, the intersection does not contain lines anymore. Then, now we consider this set, which can be easily seen, that is nothing but the efficient points of the set F with respect to the ordering induced by K. Then, if and only if this set is bounded, the set is much decomposable. And in such a case, the closed convex hull of this set is a compact component of the set. And in the case when our much decomposable sets contains no lines, 
this closed convex hull coincides with the closed convex hull of the extreme point, the set Q of F which we saw at the beginning of the talk. This means this is the smallest cost compact component in such a particular case when there are no lines. Still another representation or characterization of Motskin decomposable sets in terms, this time not of the conic representation but of linear representations of the conic representation. F is Motskin decomposable if and only if there is some linear representation of the conic representation of F such that this set of coefficients, normalized coefficients we could say, is bounded and in which case we have here a, a specific uh, Motskin decomposition of the set. Unfortunately, uh, Motskin decomposable sets do not enjoy many nice uh, calculus rules. We saw before that you, we make the intersection, uh, we, we are going to repeat this later, uh, and uh, the intersection may fail to be much decomposable. Here we have the same with the sum, the sums. The problem is that when we are the cones, the cones, uh, they are closed by definition, but the sum may fail to be closed. We have no problem when adding the compact components, but when adding the conic components, there is a problem. But this problem disappears if we use this assumption that whenever we have a sum of elements, each one belonging to the recession cone of one of the sets, and this sum is equal to zero, then the elements must belong to the linearity space of the sets. In this case, the sum is much decomposable. And this is the example as I was mentioning before. Once more, we see the, the, the ice cream cone we see here a vertical hyperplane, not containing the origin. We make the intersection, and the intersection we have seen already twice, that is not Motskin decomposable. So this, there is this unpleasant property that the intersection of Motskin decomposable sets is not necessarily Motskin decomposable. Um, in the last part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about a special kind of Motsky decompositions obtained by so-called so tran truncations. To explain the idea uh, very easily is, okay, we have a, a closed convex set, Motskin decomposable or not, we take a hyperplane, mm. okay, and, well, in, in this particular example, we have two truncations, which are the intersections with the two half spaces, and one of them happens to be compact, okay? Oh. Well, it... It turns out that How many truncations here? Here, so one of the set is divided into two parts. The truncation is look at the definition here. We take an, a hyperplane which intersects the set. Okay. This intersection we call the slice mm. of the set induced by the hyperplane. And we consider the two closed half spaces determined by H. Mm. These two um, um, half, uh, half spaces. Okay determine two intersections which are called the truncations. Mm -hmm. Okay, if one of these truncations happens to be compact, not only compact but a compact component, means that when you add the recession cone you get the whole of the set, then we have, we say that we have a Motskin decomposition of type T, of the truncation type. So these are decompositions obtained in a very particular way. Uh, then, a first question to address is when does a hyperplane inducing a non-empty slice induce a Motskin decomposition of type T? The answer is when one of the closed half spaces determined by H is compact, this is obviously a necessary condition, but this uh, compact truncation contains all the extreme points of the set. Yeah, then only you can have... If and only if. Then only you can have that decomposition. That yes. is quite intuitively clear. Otherwise, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And notice that an immediate consequence of this proposition is that if the set admits uh, Motskin decomposition of type T, it can contain no lines. If it contains one line, it's impossible to have a compact truncation. Very easy to prove. Okay. 
Well, we need to introduce here some notation, which uh, will be used later. But first, an observation is that when the a truncation has a smaller dimension than the set, the truncation coincides with the slice. Or, in other words, if the slice is properly contained in the truncation, the dimension of the truncation must be exactly the same as the, as the dimension of the, of the space. The question now is when a uh, half space induces a compact truncation. And here you have the answer. If and only if the vector belongs to the interior, to the dual of the recession cone. If the half space is defined with less than or equal to, or to minus the set if it is defined uh, the other way around. Uh, then we also have that the slice is compact and F contains no lines if and only if A belongs to one of these two sets. This result has several consequences. The first one is that if we have a set without lines, then for a hyperplane inducing an unempty slice, the slice is compact if and only if at least one of the two truncations induced by H is compact. We saw before that if there is a compact truncation, there can be no lines. But now from these results, it follows that the converse holds true. There is a compact truncation if and only if there are no lines. I'm not talking about uh, much in the composition of, of type T. I'm just talking about compact truncations. Oh, yeah, I understand. This, which is different. Uh, in particular, when we apply uh, one of the results we have seen before to, to functions, we get that for a lower semi-continuous proper convex function, in compactness, which means that the lower level sets are uh, compact, uh, occurs if and only if this particular vector belongs to the interior, to the dual cone of the recession cone of the epigraph of the function. When does a set have compact slices? If it contains no lines, it always has compact slices. And the converse holds true in dimension 2 or higher if the interior of the recession cone is non-empty. In dimension 1, this is clearly uh, not true. And one can also give examples showing that it doesn't hold true if uh, the recession cone has an empty interior. When F contains lines, it contains compact slices in just a very special case. When it is much decomposable and the recession cone is exactly one line, one whole line. There is no other possibility. Now, how to characterize Motchkin decomposable sets by means of truncations? First, an observation. If we have a compact uh, decomposition of type T. This is what we have here. A truncation which is compact plus the recession cone. Then the possibly unbounded the possibly unbounded truncation is also much decomposable with the compact component being the slice. After this observation we can make this uh, statement which says that a closed convex set is much can decomposable if and only if for every element in this set we have this decomposition. We are not saying this is a compact, a much can decomposition of type T. We are saying we have this expression. If this expression holds for every A in this set, F is much can decomposable. And in fact, it is sufficient to have just one element in this set which is smaller than that one for half for having a uh, Motskin decomposability, that is to say, for having this property for every element in the larger set. When we translate these results for functions, we get that if we consider a function with compact domain, then this function is Motskin decomposable if and only if the function is bounded on its domain. Bounded here means bounded above, because bounded below is automatically uh, 
the case because uh, we are dealing with a lower semi-continuous function on a compact set. This is when the domain is uh, compact. We later on consider the general case or a more general case, but first a proposition which we will apply for that result. If we have an unbounded closed convex set containing no lines, if H is a hyperplane and H plus is one of the half spaces determined by H, then this half space is a union of closed half lines emanating from H, if and only if the set of the extreme points of the truncation is contained in the slice. This will be used next to prove this theorem. A set is much can decomposable if and only if there is a hyperplane such that one of the truncations induced by H is compact and the other one is a union of closed half lines emanating from H. And from here, it is very easy to prove that if a set is Motzkin decomposable, then it has a Motzkin decomposition of type T. Applying the previous result to functions, we have that if the domain of the function contains no lines, then Motzkin decomposability means two things. First, that the function is in compact or lower level sets are compact. But then there is one level alpha such that on the complement of that level set, of that lower level set, we have a union of half lines on each of which the restriction of f is affine. And I will uh, finish by presenting just one result about smallest Motzkin decompositions of type T. Suppose for a Motzkin decomposable set there is a smallest compact T component. I mean, there is a Motzkin decomposition for which the compact component is the smallest among all possible compact components belonging to a Motzkin decomposition of type T. Then this smallest compact T component is the smallest in the larger set of all possible compact components of Motzkin decompositions, whether they are or type T or not. But we have an example in three dimensions which shows that in some cases there are there is a smallest compact component which is not of type T. This means that for a closed convex set without lines there is a smallest compact T component if and only if it is the smallest component among all but we know that the smallest compact component among all is Q of F. So if and only if Q of F is obtained by truncation, Q of F, I recall, is the closed convex hull of the extreme points of the set. Okay? So if this closed convex hull is obtained, can be obtained by truncation, then this is, we know, the smallest compact component, then it is the smallest compact T component. So if and only if this happens, one smallest compact component exists, but there are examples in which a smallest compact component exists, but it's not obtained by truncation, then it's not, there is no smallest, even not a minimal uh, compact component. And this is the end of my presentation.